Hello. Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone back to the class Python for Data Science, uh, IATA Plus lecture series. Uh, so last class we talked about uh, scikit-learn. Uh, one second. Yeah, so last class we talked about scikit-learn, how uh, data is represented in scikit-learn. What is the feature matrix? What, what is the uh, target array? Then uh, we talked about the estimator API, how we can use different models. Now, basically the four steps of using scikit-learn models. Choose a class of model, choose model hyperparameters, instantiate the model, arrange your data and fit the model to your data. OK. Then the last step, you can predict uh, labels or uh, regress for unknown data. Okay. Uh, we looked at uh, two examples of supervised uh, learning. Uh, one was uh, classifying iris, uh, classifying uh, flower type in this uh, iris data set. Uh, in, uh, OK, uh, so that was one uh, in unsupervised learning. We had an example of uh, dimensionality, iris dimensionality, where we wanted to visualize the whole thing in lesser dimensions. So we did a PCA. Uh, then we also looked at uh, clustering, which is again an unsupervised uh, machine learning method. So basically, we wanted to make different clusters from the data sets, and we looked at how we can do that. <laughs> At the end, we also looked at uh, a small uh, application of whatever we had uh, learned. This is basically exploring the hidden digits uh, data set, MNIST data set, and trying to predict, uh, given the images, what digit is it. Right. Uh, so next, we looked at. Uh, Hyperparameters uh, looked in detail at uh, hyperparameters and how to validate our models. Uh, what is validation? We looked at uh, different kinds of validations that we can do. So holdout sets where we hold out a certain amount of data and then test on it. Uh, cross validation where we basically do this whole thing repeated n number of times. Each time we are taking a different chunk of our data as test and a different chunk of our data as train. Right. Uh, so that's what we had discussed in last class. So today we'll be continuing uh, from here. So today we'll talk about uh, how do we uh, select the best model. So basically in data science, you'll have a lot of data and you'll try to fit different models to, uh, let's say, uh, fit something like regress something or cluster something or uh, classify something or basically predict classes and stuff like that. So, but there are a whole lot of different kinds of models that you can use for these uh, tasks. So how do we select which model is the best model? Right. So that is what we'll uh, talk about right now. So the question that is uh, that should be asked is, uh, if our under if our estimator is underperforming, how should we move forward? So there'll be possible uh, several possible ways to move forward. We can use a more complicated or more flexible model. We can use a less complicated model. We can gather more training samples. We can gather more data to add uh, more features to the data set. Right. So the answer to this question is often something that you won't expect. OK, so. Sometimes uh, using a very complicated model will give us very bad results. So what we need to do is instead of increasing our data uh, training samples or adding more features to our data, what we need to do is look for a less uh, complicated model. Right. So. Basically. Uh, the best fit model is about finding yeah uh, about finding the best model that can, that had a sweet spot between the bias and the variance of 
model. Okay, so just take a look at these two figures and then you'll figure, figure it out. Sorry, the axes are all in black, so it's not visible. So yeah, anyways, uh, so in the first, uh, so both of them have the same data, uh, same randomly generated data or something. The first one is a very simple linear model and the second one is a very complex uh, model. Okay, so you see here that the simple model is not that great because it's not fitting to a lot of the data points, right? It's just uh, attempts to find the uh, straight line that fits to the data, right? But since the data is not uh, linear, there is no straight line that can accurately uh, fit to the data. Okay, so the model basically is a very simple model which cannot capture the uh, complexity of the data set. Right. So the model is too simple in this case, in the left hand side case. OK, so. Such a model is basically set to underfit the data. OK, so basically what it means is that the model does not have enough flexibility to uh, account for all the features or all the data points, and it basically cannot represent the relationship that we want to uh, fit. It cannot basically fit accurately to the relationship that you want to fit in the data. Right. Another way of saying this is that the model has a very high bias. OK, so this is generally termed it as bias. OK, on the other hand, on the right hand side, we have a very complicated model which fits through almost all of the data points that we have in our data set. OK, so it can account for all the fine features that are present in the data set, but even though it does that, it very accurately describes all the data that it has, it has seen before that it is trained on. OK, it might be capturing some of the noise that might be there in the data. So for example, the relationship here might just be a very straight curve like this, but since we have data points that are slightly varying, that are not exactly on the line because there is some noise in our measurement. So basically the model is trying to also fit to the noise. And so it's basically overfitting it. It's fitting both to the features of the data set, but also to the noise present in the data set. Right. So in this case, so the model is set to overfit. And another way to uh, describe the scenario is that the model has a very high variance. OK, so if you look, we want to look at it as, uh, in another way, we can uh, see. So basically uh, now the blue points are the points that the model is trained on, the linear model, and the red points are the points for which the model is predicting values. OK. And then we calculate uh, something called the R squared. So R squared is basically the coefficient of determination, which basically uh, measures how well a model performs relative to a, a simple mean model. OK, so R square of one indicates that the model is perfect. OK, R square of zero indicates that the uh, model does not uh, do any better than the mean model that we have. Hmm. The mean model basically assumes that all the data points should be the value of the mean of the data. <coughs> right. So now we see that uh, training score is basically what is the R square on the training data, and validation score is basically what's the R square on the uh, held out data, the validation set of data, the testing set. Right. So in this case, we see that both the scores are comparable. It's 0.7 and 0.74 for the linear model. However, for the complex polynomial model, you see that the training score is quite high. It's 0.98, whereas the validation score is very low. OK, it's like 1.8 into 10 to the power minus 9 or something. OK, so basically what this means is if your model has a very high bias, the model will perform equally well on both training and validation sets. OK, however, if your model has a very high variance, what it will do is it will perform well on the training set, 
but very poorly on the validation side. You notice that this is exactly happening because our model is fitting to the noise present in the data. So if there was ideally no noise, the uh, data would have gone something like this. And then all of our points, there would have been points somewhere in between also. But since those are not there, the model is trying to fit all the points possible into a single line, into a single uh, curve. That's why what it's doing is it's trying to build these abrupt uh, decision lines or fits, which is basically uh, fitting to the noise in the data set. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the thing is, as you go from one model to another, uh, if you go from simpler models to complex model, your bias decreases. OK, so you tend to not overfit as much. However, your variance kind of tends to increase. So you tend to overfit more. So basically, there's like a scale of things. OK, uh, it's like a trade off. So if the bias is high, then the variance is low. If the variance is high, then the bias is low. So let's say we had some ability to uh, tune the model complexity. We would expect a curve like this. So the validation score should increase, go till a maximum, and then decrease. So for the best model, it will have the highest validation score. And the training score will keep on increasing as the model complexity increases. So an x axis will be model complexity. So as it increases, of course, the. Uh, what do you say? As the model complexity increases, it can fit more and more data points. It can basically remember all the data points fitting so closely to it. So there's a gap in this training score and validation score. So when that gap is very less, it means it has a very high bias, the thing that you have. If the gap is very high, then it means that there is a very high uh, variance in your model. The best model should be somewhere in between where the validation score is the highest and the training score is slightly higher, if not the same. Right. Yeah, so everywhere the training score. So this uh, whole curve is called a validation curve and here are the following features. So the training score is uh, everywhere is higher than the uh, validation score. So this will of course be the case because the data is trained on the training data. It has seen the training data before, so it has a better chance of predicting what it is, right? Then uh, for a high bias model, uh, the training is underfit. So which means that the model is a poor predictor both for the training data and for the validation data. OK, so you can see that both are equally well predicted and both are lower on the lower side. For a very high uh, model complexity, for a very high variance model, what will happen is the uh, model will overfit. So which means that the training score will be quite high, but it will, the validation score will be very low because the model can't generalize basically. OK, and as I was mentioning before, some for some uh, intermediate value, there's a maximum for the validation score. So that's where your uh, best model should be. Right. So, Huh. So we'll uh, just look at uh, an example of using uh, cross validation to compute the uh, validation curve for uh, polynomial models, polynomial regression models. OK, so polynomial models are basically of the form y is equal to x plus b, y is equal to x cubed plus b, something like that uh, powers. So basically, uh, when you generalize it to a large uh, number of terms, so it becomes a x to the power n plus b x to the power n minus one plus c x to the power n minus two dot 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 plus c x plus d. So basically, n powers. Okay, so yeah, so basically, in 
One second, I think I have to uh, run the import things first. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, I can just continue here. So I'll just first run the code. Okay, so basically we have defined a function called polynomial regression. Okay, which uh, takes the degree of uh, we take a degree and some other keywords. So degree you can provide uh, by default it will be two. Okay, and what we are returning is we are returning polynomial features degree and linear regression with these uh, things. So make pipeline basically makes a pipeline sort of thing. So one function, then the next, then the next, then the next. It's basically chaining uh, different functions. So first what it will do is first it will do the polynomial uh, features. It will create an equation and then it will put linear regression into it and then return the result to us. OK, so we need to create some data. So we have defined a function called make data, which basically takes n, which is the number of data points that you want. And we are randomly uh, generating data. Basically x and y. So some random generation basically. OK. So basically we are generating X randomly as a square term and then what we are doing, we are doing 10 minus 1 by X plus 0 0.1. So basically 10 minus 1 by X. Y is equal to 10 minus 1 by X. And then we we add some amount of error to it. Okay. So then uh, what we can do is we can visualize our data. So what we'll do is uh, so this is basically setting the plot uh, style. It's an optional thing. X test, is, X test is basically we are making a test set. Okay. Uh, linear space minus 0 0.1 to 1.1, 500 values we want. Okay. Then we are plotting its scatter. So X dot travel basically makes whatever X is to one dimensional. It's basically flattens or unravels the uh, whole uh, array. OK, then we are plotting X versus Y and the color is black. Axis is plot that axis for a degree in 1, 3, 5. So we are just uh, doing for these three degrees, 1, 3 and 5. Y test will be equal to polynomial regression degree dot fit dot predict. So basically polynomial regression is the function that we defined before. So we are calling that function here again. It will basically create in the first case when degree is 1. It will basically create a polynomial features one of uh, order one of, of degree one, and then it will run linear regression on it. OK, it will create a linear regression model on top of it. What we do when we fit X and Y data, it's fitting the data. Then we are predicting on the X, text, X test. OK, then what we do, we plot X test and Y test, and then mention what degree it was. OK, so that's all. Now we see when we have a degree one, which is basically a linear equation. It goes like this. It does not fit our data properly. If you have degree three, it fits goes like this, and degree five goes like this. Okay. Uh, so in this case, like the knob that we are using to control the complexity of the model or complexity of our machine learning model is uh, basically the degree of the polynomial, which can be any non-negative integer, right? Mm, so the question that we want to uh, answer now, the question that we had before regarding uh, overfitting, underfitting, and best model. So the question is, what model should we choose, or what degree should our best model have? Okay, what degree of the polynomial provides a suitable trade-off between the bias and the variance? Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll uh, visualize the validation curve. Okay. 
So basically here what we are doing. Uh, SQLR has a function called validation curve. We'll be using that. OK. So it basically gives you training score and validation score. Uh, validation curve, you give it polynomial regression because that's a, a model we want to run. X and Y is our data. Uh, OK, so the parameter that we want to modify is in polynomial regression is polynomial features underscore degree and we want it to be uh, a range from 0 to 21. 0 to 21. OK, cross validation is basically how many uh, times cross validation do you want to do here? So it's basically uh, CV7 means it will do a seven fold cross validation. Then we are basically plotting it. So plotting degree and the train score, then degree and the validation score, and X label, Y label, everything. And if you run this, we see that this is the validation uh, curve. This is the validation curve that we get. So basically, uh, when we have a degree of zero, our model accuracy is zero because we don't have anything we just have a constant uh, <coughs> uh, then when we move up uh, slowly as the model complexity increases we see that the training score uh, quickly rises and the validation score also initially quickly rises but after a point the validation score starts dropping whereas the training score keeps on increasing okay so and everywhere note that the training score is higher than the validation score. OK. <clears throat> and the validation score reaches the maximum before dropping off uh, because the model starts overfitting. OK, so from here we can determine the optimal trade off between uh, bias and variance. OK, it's uh, found somewhere here, which which should be the uh, degree three. OK third order polynomial. So what we do now, we basically uh, do a <clears throat> on the previous data, uh, on the data set that we have, what we do is we basically, uh, on the XY data that we have, we basically fit a uh, three degree polynomial regression equation, and then we basically plot the results. Now if we plot this, so this is what the uh, best fit model is. In this case, so just a quick uh, recap. So basically, what we did here was we started out with some data, some random data. <coughs> Sorry, random polynomial data. Then what we did, we tried to see uh, using different degrees of polynomials, how would the line fit? Uh, how would the fit line look? Okay. Then we saw the validation curve uh, to select our model, to select what the uh, degree of our model should be. So we see that the validation score has the highest validation score for uh, degree three. Uh, so what we do is we choose that point uh, as our best model, and then we train again and we get this beautiful fitted line to our data. So basically that's the uh, whole process. Right of selecting the best model. OK. Uh, another thing is uh, model. Uh, the optimal model that you need will also depend on the size of your training data. If you have too many data points, you might most likely will need a slightly uh, more complex model to deal with it. So for example, let's say we make more data. Uh, so we are basically using the same equation make data that we had uh, before somewhere here. Uh, here initially we made a data of just 40 data points. Uh, now what we are doing is we are making a data of 200 data points. And then we are basically plotting to show uh, what it looks like. This is what it looks like. <coughs> okay, it's basically an exponential equation with some error. Okay. Now we just copy the square. Uh, so we have written it as X to Y2. So we just copy the code that we had before to uh, basically um, show the validation curve. So we run this and we see that. Uh, 
So the dotted lines are basically uh, given from the previous uh, figure. So when we were using less number of points, so this is basically given in the dotted line here. And the other ones are uh, the <coughs> <coughs> sorry, training score and validation score for the uh, uh, new data set, which has 200 points. You see that already the validation score is not dropping so early. It can go well beyond uh, 17 or 18. Right. Like, for example, in this case, a degree 20 model is also not overfitting the data. The validation and the uh, training scores are almost similar in this case also. Right. Uh, so the behavior of the validation curve will depend both on your model complexity and also on the number of training points that you have, the training data points that you have. OK. Uh, we can like gain further insight into this by exploring the uh, behavior of the model as a function of number of training points. OK, uh, so here what we did was we visualized uh, the model uh, score versus the degree. But uh, now what we want to do is uh, we want to pick one model and then be, uh, observe its behavior by increasing the number of training points it gets. OK. So these, uh, this kind of plot is known as a learning curve, basically. So this kind of thing is known as a uh, learning curve. So this is basically a learning curve. Right. So <clears throat> basically, if you add more and more data points, your training score will slightly decrease because initially you had less data point uh, for your uh, model, and now you have more. So it will keep on decreasing. Uh, then your validation score will also keep on increasing as your model fits the data better and better because it gets more and more data points. So at a point, they, when they both are uh, getting to converge, that point is, is basically the good fit place. Okay, so basically three things, uh, the general behavior that uh, of these uh, learning curves is uh, uh, given as follows. So basically, uh, Yeah, a model of a given complexity might uh, overfit, uh, so will basically overfit on a small data set. So the training score will be high and the validation score will be low. Uh, the model uh, of a given complexity will uh, tend to like uh, underfit a very large data set. So the training score will decrease, but the validation score should increase. And like, uh, the model should never, uh, except by chance, give a better score on validation set than the training set. So basically, these curves should get closer and closer, but they should never uh, cross. <coughs> Randomly, it might happen once or twice here and there, but uh, you, uh, if you do cross validations and everything and properly you are uh, making repeated measurements and uh, building repeated models, cross-validating your models, you shouldn't have a uh, val validation score higher than the training score. OK. So basically what this means is uh, your training score and your validation score will increase or decrease up till a certain point, and after that it becomes stagnant doesn't matter how many more data points you had because once you have enough data points that your model has properly converged on the data, adding any more of the data points will not help you. The only way to uh, increase model performance in this case is to use uh, a more complex model. OK. So. 
basically here we are trying to compute a learning curve for our original data set of 40 points with a second order polynomial and a ninth order polynomial model. Okay, so basically we are creating uh, figures and subplots. Here what we are doing, uh, we are using the learning curve function present in sklearn that model selection. It takes uh, what function we want, uh, what regression. So basically we're doing polynomial regression. Uh, X and Y is our original data, cross validation is seven. Uh, training sizes is how much size you want to train it in. You want to train the model in, basically. Uh, so uh, training size should be like 0.3 to 25. Slowly we increase the uh, <clears throat> size of the training data set and we plot the curve basically. And uh, here we are enumerating over two and nine so that we create both the models two and nine. And then we are basically plotting it all. Okay. So basically, uh, one is the mean. One thing is the mean, which should be the uh, blue line. Mean, sorry, is the uh, score training, and then validation score is the red one, and the uh, dashed line is basically. The convergence of training and validation. Right. So, what is the final last value of the validation or the uh, training set? Okay, so we see that basically when you have mm, a slightly less complex model uh, here in in this case the model of degree two, what happens is uh, as the number of data points increase, of course the model accuracy will increase. Okay, mm. the validation score will increase, and it will go and fix at a certain value. Yeah. Sorry, the training score will, uh, on the other hand, keep on decreasing and fix on a certain value. OK, and this value you notice somewhere close to, let's say, 0.88. OK, and in this case, we have a polynomial of degree, degree 9. So we see that the uh, validation score starts increasing only after the training size is uh, 26 or 27 or something. Right, whereas here in this case, it started much before 15. So basically here our model is not learning a lot of useful things. Still, uh, we supply like 25 data points because we have too many parameters to train in a nine degree model. There are too many coefficients to fit. Uh, here you see that the convergent value that we have for both the curves, it's coming as slightly more. Maybe let's say 0.92 or something which is greater than the one that we had in uh, degree two. OK, so this basically gives us a, a visual depiction of uh, how our model is reacting to increasing amounts of data. Uh, in particular, when the uh, when the learning has already converged, when both of them are close together and we should uh, stop adding any more data to it and stuff like that. So we can use it for diagnostic purposes like that. OK. Uh, so yeah, so in this case, like uh, as we go to more and more complex models and increase the amount of data points we have, the models will also start fitting better and you'll get higher uh, scores. OK, but till a certain point after that data doesn't help you. Right. Uh, so uh, now what we'll be doing is we'll be practicing uh, basically how to do uh, validation properly and 
uh, SQL. Uh, so so basically, uh, what we saw above was uh, regarding bias and variance, how to select the uh, best model that does not underfit, but also does not overfit, right? Uh, so generally, when we are trying to move from simpler to complex models, we don't generally have a single value or variable that we can change. For example, in the case of volume allegation, we just increase the degree, let's say, which was just one variable. But many models which have will have a lot of uh, different uh, variables or hyperparameters that we can change to uh, basically uh, make the model more complex or make the model simpler, right? So in this case, what we need to go through is not just one axis of uh, variation in hyperparameter, but multiple axes, multi multiple dimensions of uh, variation in hyperparameters of different models, and which one of those is the best model or the uh, yeah the best model for us that balances both the bias and the variance for the data set. So, uh, grid search is basically uh, how you address this question. Okay. So, what we'll do here is we'll uh, I'll show you an example of how it's uh, used and what we do basically. So, we'll consider the use of grid search to find the optimal polynomial model. Uh, we'll explore a two dimensional grid of model features. So, basically, the polynomial degree and whether we want to fit an intercept or not. Uh, we can use uh, grid search CV, which is present in SQL and that model selection to help us with it. So param grid is basically a grid of parameters that we are building. So polynomial features degree. So degree we want to vary from 0 to 20. Then uh, fit intercept, linear aggregation fit intercept. We want to vary it between true and false. So either we want to fit an intercept with a one degree per polynomial model, or we don't want to fit an intercept with a one degree polynomial model, or you want a two degree polynomial model with no intercept, or two degree polynomial model with intercept, and so on till 21. We have all these different parameters that we can change and vary and mix and match, and we'll see how it affects our <coughs> model. So grid is basically grid search CV. Polynomial regression is our uh, function. Param grid contains all the parameters that we want to uh, look through. And CV is basically cross validation. You want seven fold cross validation. OK. So here what we did, we just created a model, instantiated a, mo instantiated a model. We have not applied any data or not fit to it. So what we need to do is we need to fit it first. OK, so we do grid dot fit fit and X and Y we provide our data. One second. OK, so now that we have fit the model, we can ask it for the best parameters. So grid dot best underscore params underscore will basically give you <coughs> which model should best fit your data. So fit intercept should be false and the polynomial degree should be four. OK, so here again we are copying code that we had used before. We are basically uh, using grid dot best estimator, so which gives us basically the best model that was found by the uh, grid search cross validation. Uh, then we are just basically plotting X and Y and the model, predictions of the model. Rx, and we see that the model fits the data like this. So this is the best model that we have found, both by varying the fit intercept and the degrees of a polynomial function. And looking through the whole uh, grid of parameters, we found that these two parameters are the best. OK, so that's it for hyperparameter uh, and cross hyperparameters and cross validation, right? Uh, so next we'll move on to something called uh, feature engineering. So basically, uh, 
the previous uh, chapters have outlined uh, the fundamental ideas of uh, machine learning, but uh, all of this have always assumed that our data will come in a very clean and tidy uh, number of samples into number of features format. However, in the real life, when you are out collecting data or you are observing something, you uh, generally don't get data in this uh, proper form, right? So here in feature engineering, what we want to do is uh, basically uh, we want to uh, modify our data, arrange it in a proper way so that we can use it for our uh, more uh, machine learning things. Okay. So basically, uh, feature engineering is taking whatever information you might have and turning it into a more uh, into numbers and building a uh, feature matrix out of it, such that all the relationship between all the data is also uh, maintained. Where uh, while your computer can also understand what you're trying to say, and your model can also fit to the numbers that you have, right? So we'll look at a few tasks. Uh, so the first thing is how do we represent categorical features? So one common uh, non-numerical type of data that we have is categorical data. So <clears throat> let's say you're looking at house prices and uh, along with uh, some uh, numbers such as the price of the house and the number of rooms, uh, you also have information on where the house is. So what is the neighborhood of the house? So this uh, data should look something like this. OK, so data. You see, it's basically this. It's just a dictionary, not a data frame. Uh, so one straightforward way to encode this neighborhood thing that is basically a categorical variable into uh, a straightforward numerical mapping uh, is to use a straightforward uh, numerical mapping. So basically, Queen Anne, we give it a number of one, Fremont, we give it a number of two, Wallingford, we give it a number of three, and so on for each of the data points that we have, we give it different numbers. Okay, so turns out that this is not a good approach in Scikit-learn because uh, most of the models that you have, that you will be training, make the fundamental assumption that numbers behave as numbers, right? So basically what they mean is if you have two into Queen Anne, you get a Freeman. Or if you add uh, Queen Anne and Freeman, you get Wallingford. And those kinds of things are basically not things that we can do with categorical variables, right? We cannot basically add, subtract, or multiply, divide categorical variables. There's no order between them and things like that, right? So <clears throat> what to do in this case? how to deal with these categorical features. So one thing that we can do is to use uh, one, hot encode, one hot encoding. So one hot encoding basically uh, makes extra columns in your data set for each of the uh, levels of the category, uh, or each of the values of the category that you have. And in each of the column, you have a binary system, either a one or a zero, one uh, indicating that uh, Yes, it belongs to this category, and zero means no, it does not belong to this category. So, uh, scikit-learn has a dict vectorizer feature uh, uh, function which we can use to uh, vectorize our uh, data that we have before here, the dictionary data. So, we basically initiate the dict vectorizer, and then we fit and transform our data. So we get basically. So initially our data was this. Right. Now our data is basically this. So price we have here, rooms we have here, and the rest of the things have become three columns. So the first column will be Queen Anne. Uh, Okay, the first one is Freeman. So zero, one, zero, one, because second one and fourth one is Freeman. The second one is Queen Anne, because the first one is Queen Anne. And the third one is Wellingford, the column names. Right. <coughs> so basically, the neighborhood column has been expanded into three separate uh, columns. 
representing all the labels that we had for neighborhood and each of the column cells will have either one or zero as the value. OK. So we can get the names of the data uh, features. We can basically get the names of each column using vect uh, dot get feature names out. It will give us basically all the names of the features. So the first one is frame and second one is queen and third one is Hollingford, fourth one is price, and the last one is the number of rooms. Right. One second. So uh, one clear disadvantage of using one hot encoding is that if you have a large number of labels in your category, large number of possible values, then this will greatly increase the dimensions of your data set. So because, but since most of these numbers will be zero, we can basically use a uh, parse output which is basically a computer's way of storing it more efficiently. So when you do the dict vectorizer, if you put sparse is equal to true, you get a sparse matrix instead of a matrix. OK, so it's basically stored in a different format that you can't visualize exactly like you visualize this. But uh, it's basically a compacted form of the whole thing. So it does not uh, take a lot of space or basically makes the computations and everything faster. Right. Uh, nearly all of the scikit-learn estimators accept such sparse inputs while fitting and evaluating models. Scilearn dot preprocessing dot one hot encoder and scilearn dot feature extraction dot feature hasher are two additional tools that include help in this type of encoding. So dict vectorizer is the one that we use to vectorize our dic dictionary. Uh, here in one hot encoder and feature hasher are two more uh, feature or uh, two more uh, functions that you can use. This one hot encoder works in finders data frames also. Great. Uh, another common uh, need in feature engineering is basically to convert text to a uh, to some representative numeric value. So, for example, when you are use, uh, when you are uh, building a like, let's say, uh, movie review analyzer model, or you are like mining data from social media or something. So, you basically get a lot of these text data that you want to represent as numbers because your models don't understand text, right? They understand numbers. So you want a mapping from text to numbers, but in this mapping, you want to preserve all the semantic meaning of the text and everything else also. Uh, like how the text is structured and everything. So things like that. So some amount of basically uh, structure and relatedness you want to mention uh, preserve in a text when you're converting it to number. So for example, we have the following set of three phrases, problem of evil, evil queen, and horizon problem. Horizon problem. OK. So one of the simplest methods uh, we can use is to <coughs> encode phrases such as this as uh, word counts. So basically, uh, you make a individual columns representing all the words that we have. So the representing all the words problem of evil and so on, and then uh, we can basically uh, fill it based on the number of times the word occurs. So when we use uh, the count vectorizer in, uh, from scikit-learn, which basically does this, so we uh, instantiate a count vectorizer, then we fit and transform a sample. So it basically stores it in a sparse row format. 
So the result is basically a sparse matrix that is recording the number of times each of the word appears. Uh, <clears throat> it's easier to see if we convert it into a data frame. So basically we are converting it to a data frame. And then we'll uh, take a look at it. So basically what it did is it got all the words that we have. It made all the words as columns and then it. So for data point one, it has problem of evil. So it has evil, it has off, it has problem. The rest of the words it does not have. The second one, it has evil, it has queen. It's evil queen. The third one, it is horizon problem. It has horizon and problem and does not have the rest. OK. So that's the thing. Uh, so one issue with this kind of uh, simple raw word count as a uh, feature is that uh, it leads to having too much weight on words that appear very frequently. So for example, words like off or and or the, which might be appearing more and more frequently in your uh, text because just because they are uh, very important to the structure of a sentence and not to the meaning of the overall text that you have. Uh, so basically uh, what happens is uh, these features, these words can have more weightage to them because they occur more frequently. So one way that we can fix this is by using something called term frequency inverse document frequency, TFIDF, which basically weighs each word uh, by a measure of how often they appear in the documents or in the uh, text data that we have. So we have a TFID vectorizer as uh, we had a count vectorizer in SQLearn. SQLearn basically has everything. Okay, so we just fit and transform our data, then we make it and convert it into a data frame so that we can see what's happening. So this is basically what's happening. Okay. So each word count is weighed by how many times it exactly occurs in the document. So the values are changing also. OK. So it's basically what is the frequency of this word occurring here into what is the inverse of the frequency of the word occurring in the whole document. So that is basically TFIDF term frequency into inverse document frequency, right? Uh, the next thing is basically image features. So image features are <clears throat> so like in the uh, Last class when we talked about scikit-learn, we uh, trained on the MNIST data set. So we are basically using uh, images as raw, pix raw pixel values of images. And then what we are doing is basically uh, spread them out into uh, one dimension and then uh, change the dimensions into how much ever we require and everything. And then we were able to uh, basically use the uh, raw pixel values to train the model. However, in some cases, you might this might not be the case. You might want to make exact different features from your images or transform your images in some other way. So for that, uh, it might be better to look at some other comprehensive sources, such as uh, Feature engineering working with images, which is also a part of this uh, Python for Data Science handbook. So I urge you to go through the whole handbook and look through different parts which interest you. 
if you're more interested in working with images, if you're uh, already working with images, then I suggest you look at all these things. OK. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is uh, derived features. So basically, another use useful type of feature that we have is uh, mathematically derived from some input features. OK. So. Basically, uh, for example, like uh, let's say we'll take this example. So we have X and Y data here, which looks something like this. It's basically for one, it's for, for two, it's two, for three, it's one, four, it's three, five, it's seven. It's basically some polynomial, right? Like this. Okay. Uh, so we can't exactly fit a line through it using linear regression. Whereas uh, you would think that we can't exactly fit a line through it using linear regression. We can basically still fit a line through it. Okay, even if it does not describe the data uh, properly, we can still fit a line through it, right? Okay, so. OK, I'll go over it again. Sorry uh, for that sudden burst of weirdness. Yeah, so uh, basically derived features uh, are mathematically derived from some other input features. OK, so for example, let's say we have this data set of X and Y that I have plotted here. I just generated, uh, not generated, I just used these data points, X and Y. This is basically a polynomial thing, right? We can't fit a line through it that describes it. If we try to do this using linear regression, we get a line something like this, which does not explain the data, right? Because linear regression cannot fit the value of X and Y here because it's not complex enough, right? We need a slightly more sophisticated, sophisticated model. One way to approach the problem will be to leave linear regression and go to polynomial regression or do something else, right? The other thing would be to transform the data. So for example, what we'll do here is, we'll basically add more features to the data. So we are basically in a, in a, uh, instantiating a polynomial features class here uh, with degree of three. Then we are uh, fit and transfer it to our uh, X data that we have. So we get X2, now we are printing X2. So X2 is basically X was what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So x2 here is basically 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1 square, 2 square, 3 square, 4 square, 5 square. 1 cube, 2 cube, 3 cube, 4 cube, 5 cube. Because the degree is 3. Right. <clears throat> so what we did here, we basically used the x column and then generated more columns, which are basically squares or cubes of the same column. OK. So. Now we can use this in our input matrix as our input matrix. Instead of just having uh, the x value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we can have the whole matrix as an input for our linear regression. So we'll have multiple uh, different, uh, so this won't be simple linear regression, it's multiple linear regression. So we have multiple predictors now. Instead of just x, we have x, x square, x cube. Now what we'll do, we are basically using linear regression to again fit. Now we are fitting x2 to y, and we are predicting uh, what is the value. So model that predict x2, we store it at y fit. We plot a scatter plot of x and y, then we plot y x and y fit. Now you see that the model is kind of fitting the data that we have. So basically, what we are doing here, we are improving our model, not by changing our model, but by transforming the inputs that we have. Right. This is basically a very uh, fundamental strategy implemented by many more powerful machine learning methods, uh, such as support vector machines and all that. Okay. Uh, you can look further into uh, these kinds of things if 
this interests you about how to transform your data and uh, add it to your data set as more features. Uh, you can take a look into these in-depth uh, lessons uh, in the Python data size handbook. Uh, so basically, I'll just open the website. So basically, we are here at feature engineering. This is the part that we are currently talking about. Uh, however, there are other documents which go through uh, in depth of different uh, machine learning models or algorithms that are there in sklearn so simple linear uh, regression multiple linear regression and everything uh, what is the regularization and everything so these kinds of uh, things basically and uh, how these different models work and uh, what they are utilizing under the hood and something if you want to figure out and how to train better models you should take a look at those things uh, they are all linked to here also in the uh, Python notebooks that I'll be providing you guys. OK. And I think the OK, the second last thing is uh, imputation of uh, missing data. So another common uh, need of feature engineering is handling of uh, missing data. So basically nan is often used to mark missing values so for example let's say we have a data set like this we have uh, x and y we have some missing values in x right one second uh, we have some missing values we notice uh, denoted as nns so uh, when we are uh, applying a machine learning algorithm or a model to such data, what we first need to do is we need to replace the missing values with some appropriate value. OK, so this uh, process is basically known as imputation of missing values. We had earlier uh, discussed this when we were discussing pandas, how to do this uh, for your data frame, how to basically replace some of the NANs in a row or a column by the mean of the row or column and stuff like that. Right. Uh, Scikit-learn also provides some tools such as this class called Simple Imputer, which basically helps uh, transform your data and then uh, impute uh, data there. So what we do is Simple Imputer, we basically give it a strategy. Here we are giving the strategy mean. So it will basically uh, fill the NNs with the mean of the whole column. OK, uh, then X2 is basically our model dot fit transform X. So it's basically fitting to X and then transforming X again. We store it as X2 and X2 is this. OK, so when we use the strategy mean, we basically see that the NN values in these two have been replaced by the uh, corresponding mean values of the column. Right. Uh, Uh, then once we are done with the uh, missing value imputation, we can uh, continue with our model, whatever it was. Let's say it was a linear regression or something. We continue with that. OK. So. Whatever we learned before uh, now here in feature engineering, all the uh, preceding uh, transformations that we had to do for our data in each step and everything. It can become very tedious if you are doing it by hand, especially if you are stringing together a lot of different steps of uh, feature engineering, such as first, let's say you have a very complex data set which has some missing values, which has some uh, categorical value values, which has some uh, derived, which you, which you want some derived features, you want uh, you have some text features also. 
so basically what happens is it gets very tedious to do all of these one by one and it get, gets very hard to keep track of your code also. OK, so what we can do is if you want to string together multiple steps that are provided by scikit-learn, we can create what is called a processing pipeline that basically does the steps that we wanted to do. So for example, if we want to create a processing pipeline that does imputation of missing values using mean, transforms features to quadratic and fits a linear regression model. OK, so to do uh, create this kind of pipeline, what we do is we use the make underscore pipeline function in sklearn.pipeline. So what we are doing, model is equal to make pipeline, simple imputer strategy mean. So basically first step is do the imputation. Second step is polynomial features degree to so you basically transform the features to from linear to quadratic and then linear regression. So you fit a regression model. So this we have created an instance of a pipeline. So your pipeline in our case com consists of the following three different steps. Next, what we do, the pipeline basically has a fit function. We can use that fit function and the predict function. So basically model dot fit X and Y will carry out all the three steps for the X and Y data that we have. So let's say as before, if you recall, X values, we had some NNs. So we are using that X and the Y. Y was also some array. OK, five numbers. Yeah, basically fitting. Uh, when we are fitting, we are doing three steps. First, we are doing the sim, uh, imputation using mean. Next, we are uh, transforming the data into quadratic. And then third, we are fitting a linear regression to it. Then uh, basically, OK, we are printing Y and then we are printing what the model predicts Y to be. OK, this turns out to be perfectly matching. So basically, it's absolutely matching because X is the data it was trained on and X is the data we are using to predict. OK. So yeah, so pipelines can come in real handy when you uh, want to string together a bunch of different things. Uh, for let's say you want to run a model and you know what preprocessing steps you need for the model and everything. So you can basically easily make a pipeline and then keep running that pipeline instead of trying to do each of the steps manually one by one and then keeping track of what step uh, produce what output and how to feed it to the next step and everything. Uh, this pipeline thing basically makes your life much simpler in while using scikit -learn. Okay. So basically, I would suggest you go back and look at all these different things. Uh, all the in-depth chapters that are there in the handbook, which go through the depths of different uh, machine learning algorithms and try to tell you more about them. Uh, that's a really good uh, resource to look at to get to know more about scikit-learn uh, and get better at uh, using scikit-learn. OK, uh, that's all. Uh, I think, yeah, so this marks the end of uh, module seven. So module seven was all about scikit-learn, how data is represented in scikit-learn, how what is the process of using scikit-learn, how to use the estimator API, uh, then basically what are hyperparameters, uh, how do we validate models, uh, how, how do you validate models? What are hyperparameters? How to choose best hyperparameters? How to select the best model for your data? And then feature engineering, how to uh, go from raw features or categorical or text features that you have to the final numerical matrix that you'll be using for uh, training and testing of all your data and everything. And then again, how to chain all these feature engineering and uh, machine learning tasks using pipeline. So that's quite a lot of things that we have uh, studied over the past two weeks. OK, so as we part today, uh, so since this is the second last module of the course, we just have one more uh, module after this. 
uh, we'll talk about that in a uh, second. So basically, uh, you are given. Uh, so this module, I won't be uh, discussing the exercises online. Uh, I'll send you a copy of the. So I won't be discussing the answers online. Uh, it's just for your practice. Uh, this is something that we have uh, done before, right? Uh, so it's just for your practice so that you get more comfortable with doing uh, things using scikit-learn. Basically using all the things that we have learned till now. Pandas, NumPy, yes, scikit-learn, matplotlib, uh, and everything. So uh, today's assignment is basically one simple question. Uh, that will help you reinforce the chain of commands that you need to do to uh, perform data science on data, to fit models to data and transform your data and get predictions out of it or uh, fit models to your data and everything. So, uh, basically, the question is you are given the iris data set. Okay. Uh, right. A set of code to basically split the iris data set into 80% training and 20% testing out of the total 150 records 120 should be in training and 30 should be in testing train your data using k nearest neighbor algorithm to make clusters uh, and basically create a plot of K values and uh, accuracy. So how does your accuracy change if you increase the number of Ks? So it's basically K nearest neighbor classifier. So use the species thing as the class and the rest of the things to basically uh, make the prediction of class. Okay, so you have to build a classification model. Right. Then what you need to do finally is you need to, I don't need the model, I don't need the accuracy or anything. I need how the accuracy varies as you change the num the k value that you take. So your k nearest neighbor should range from let's say one to ten or one to twenty or something. And how does your uh, accuracy value of your model? How does the accuracy of your model vary accordingly? Okay, so that's it for module seven. I won't be discussing the answer for this question. It's too simple. I'll share the answer uh, with you at the end of the next class. So the next class will probably be the last class. Uh, probably not. It, it will be the last class. Uh, we'll just be discussing about uh, the sample project. That is the last module of the course. So. Basically, uh, we have a data set uh, put up by IBM for analysis. The, the data set has 35 features along with our target variable, which is attrition. So this is a fictional data set that is created by IBM data scientists, which has various different uh, features. And uh, attrition is our target variable. Attrition is basically if the uh, employee resigned or not. Right. Uh, and uh, the rows of the data frame are basically different employees. So the objective will be to predict if an employee is going to resign or not. So we are basically going to make a predictive model given some factors. Is this person going to resign or not? OK. Uh, so what we need to do, we need to explore different factors, take a look at how they uh, <clears throat> work with employee attrition and then how each, each feature is correlated with attrition and then use that to our advantage to build a predictive, good predictive model. OK. Uh, if possible, I would urge you to download the data set and try out a few ideas of your own. We'll solve the problem in the next class, which will be the last class. Uh, so there are a few more bonus projects that I have suggested here uh, with additional data sets. So what we what you can do basically uh, one thing is you can basically take this 
uh, employee attention thing forward. Or you can look at uh, two more different data sets that are generally uh, easy to begin with in data science, such as the house price prediction data set and the Titanic data set. Uh, <clears throat> and it might be fun for you to try and answer these objective questions that are uh, given here also. But we'll talk more about the bonus projects at the end of the course. So for now, I want to uh, I want you to focus on the uh, IBM employee attention analysis and prediction. So uh, basically, you can go to Kaggle and download this uh, data set here. Or you can just go to Kaggle and search for this data set. You'll get the data set. Then you can try out uh, things on your own. And next class, we'll discuss uh, how to basically uh, go uh, figure out this objective, how to figure out if an employee is going to resign or not, how to build a good enough model for that. OK. <clears throat> so that's it for today. Uh, next class, we won't be discussing anything about anything before. Uh, all modules went through seven. We won't be discussing anything about them uh, again. We'll just move on to the project. We'll talk about the project. We'll talk about bonus projects. Uh, there might be some tips and tricks that I'll uh, tell you. And mostly that's all. So that will be the last class. Uh, so today we are signing off at this. We have finished, officially finished, finished all parts of our learning for this course. Next week is more like uh, application hands on of uh, hands on and getting a feeling of how things are in the real life. OK. So I'll meet you guys uh, next week, same time Thursday. Uh, thanks a lot for being uh, attending the classes. We'll meet you next week. Bye.